Nana Chanchalishuli. I'm a neurosurgeon and neuroscientist from Georgia. And I work at West Georgia Medical Center. Uh, these online educational meetings have started with Professor Hassan Kamil Suju, the program manager of Izmir Atatok Training and Research Hospital in Turkey, and goes on with contribution with all the residents. Uh, neurosurgeons and neurosurgery residents who graduated from the same department. Neurosurgeons and neurosurgery residents from nearby countries like Bulgaria and Georgia. I kindly ask you to keep your microphones turned off during the presentation of the lecture to avoid the noise and noise pollution. You can ask your question not by turning on the microphone, but by writing in the chat part of the Zoom program. At the end of the presentations, your questions will be asked to the lecturer and will be discussed. Mutual discussion is not appropriate uh, for our meeting. Uh, so now I'd like to inter uh, briefly introduce uh, Dr. Antrashke, uh, sorry if I mispronounce it again. Uh, so uh, he has graduated um, uh, Ludwig Maximilian University at Munich in 2000. Uh, uh, he passed the state exams in 2000. Uh, so in a, then he uh, got his MD degree, uh, doctor, uh, de doctorate degree in radiation therapy at Technical University in Munich. And um, uh, then two years postdoctoral fellowship at Anderson Cancer Center in USA, and then uh, a specialist in a radiotherapy clinic for radiotherapy and radiology at Technical University of Munich. And uh, then uh, since 2007, he was working as a senior physician uh, in the uh, clinic for radi radiation therapy and radiological oncology in Technical University of Munich. And uh, since two, uh, 2010, he was uh, um, as a private lecturer at the same uh, institution. And uh, since uh, 2012, he was a senior physician and a uh, um, uh, clinic physician for radiology therapy at the University of Rostock. And uh, then he was working as a senior physician and uh, um, at clinic for radiation uh, oncology at University Hospital in Zurich since uh, 2014. And um, the, uh, the University Hospital in Zurich is uh, right now appointment as is an adjunct professor at the University of Zurich, and uh, since 2017 he's a deputy clinic uh, director cl uh, at Clinic for Radiation Oncology at University Hospital in Zurich, and his uh, um, uh, so his core competencies are you know, radiation therapy, quality assurance uh, with the clinical trials, and uh, complex radiation planning. Um, so, Dr. Uh, Andratska, you're welcome to start your screen sharing and your lecture. We're pleased to host you with the lecture. Excellent. Thank you very much, Nana, for this kind introduction. And I hope you can see my screen right now. It should be yes, shared. Yes, you can. Excellent. Yes. And also to the Izmir Faculty of Neurosurgery for giving me the opportunity to talk, to talk about the subject on stereotactic radiosurgery for brain metastasis, or more specific on multiple brain metastasis. And of course, I have some disclosures and the disclosures, of course, that I'm as a radiation oncologist am biased um, towards uh, radiosurgery and stereotactic radiotherapy, which I will allude to uh, in the next couple of slides. <clears throat> a quick outline of my presentation. First, I would like to give some fundamentals of radiosurgery and also specifics, um, how we have to deal uh, with imaging and treatment planning, and especially uh, in the context of multiple brain metastases. Then I would like to switch to a general overview of how to manage brain metastasis, and maybe in the end, with a couple of slides, give a special consideration to the question of early versus delayed local treatment, it is radiosurgery or even repeat brain radiosurgery, which I would call uh, management of multiple brain metastasis as well. Now, switching to the uh, fundamentals of radiosurgery. So, it all began in the realm of neurosurgery where the stereotactic frame was adapted um, to the focal delivery uh, of condensed radiation beams. In the beginning, it was the gamma knife using cobalt sources. Uh, and then but gradually, it was adopted by the radiation oncology community, but then switching to a frame-based uh, stereotactic coordinate system so that it could be used on a Linux. And finally, it was frameless, just using a mask system and the respective imaging capabilities on a linear accelerator. Uh, the advantage was that it was non-invasive in this context, and it was easier to exploit 
the effect of and, and the beauties of fractionation. And we will um, allude to that later on again. <clears throat> but let's first switch to the imaging aspects for target delineation, because that's a very important part when we plan our radiosurgical treatment. And this is just a practical depiction of a planning CT we still acquire and an MRI, which gives us a much better, better tissue contrast to depict the individual brain metastasis. But the important step is here uh, to first acquire those images uh, with a very thin slice thickness and the orientation in treatment position. Then um, uh, have a distortion correction of the MRI and afterwards a proper image registration of those two images. Because on the MRI, we will draw the, um, the targets. On the planning CT, we will have the dose distribution calculated. So it's very important to have it in a, radi in a radiation ready position acquired. Um, but not only the imaging position is relevant, but also the question of what sequences uh, we should use for imaging. Uh, there, the most important uh, step is to have a 3D volumetric sequence with a small slice thickness. But here's an interesting work where um, colleagues from the Netherlands compared the usage of MPRH and that specific T1 space sequence with respect to whether or not one or the other sequence could uh, depict the metastasis much better uh, with some examples given here. And what this graph shows us is that um, the way they used and employed MPRH, they could detect almost 80% of the lesions, but could increase this detection rate, uh, rate if they combined not only MPRH, but also space. But even more importantly, when they looked at those images in the multidisciplinary team, they could further increase um, the, the, the detection of the different targets and also uh, make the right choices. And interestingly, in their case series, it also translated into a benefit with regards to the um, intracr distant intracranial failure rate. So um, the curve in purple here is on the MPRH only where not all metastases had been depicted. And the other one is the combination. So at the first time of diagnosis or treatment of those newly depicted brain metastases, <clears throat> uh, more metastases were found in the, in the combination. And this also translated in a longer time to intracranial uh, distant failure. So whether this then translates into better oral survival is questionable. We don't know at the moment. But if we look at oral survival metrics like distant metastasis volume, uh, distant um, metastasis velocity, this might have an impact that such patient might get a wrong, assigned the wrong score if we three months later scan and find so-called new metastasis, which could have been detected already three months earlier. So this would wrongly assign them into a worse EMV class. <clears throat> So now why should it be in treatment position? And these are images overlaid. And in treatment position, it means if you just take an imaging uh, image from a diagnostic scanner, your head could be tilted differently uh, compared to the treatment position. <clears throat> and this could especially um, affect areas of the brain stem where different tilting might uh, um, result, if you look at the delineation, might result in although it's only a couple of millimeters in a not ideal uh, image registration position. And this might also affect the way you can set up a patient, you can delineate the lesions, and then you can respectively target them at the machine. So we can reduce registration uncertainties if we have the CT and MR acquired in treatment position. Um, another important aspect to consider is really the the, 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 the distortion of, of an MRI. <clears throat> oh, I'm sorry. So if you look here at an image, MR image, where it has not been distortion corrected in relation um, to the respective planning CT scan, then you can already improve if you 
do a distortion correction in 2D, but the optimum result you get if you do a 3D dose, um, a 3D distortion correction. And this is very important because the geometric information is not as accurate if you do not use distortion correction. And the colleagues here already also published on that while they looked at old data where no distortion correction was used and they found significantly inferior local control if no distortion correction was used. So if you set up a radio surgery program, look out for a quality assured distortion correction. <clears throat> Now, how to delineate if you have done everything fine so far? Well, we focus on the contrast uh, enhanced lesion. We delineate it on the MRI. Uh, we encompass and we try to encompass all contrast enhancing areas and especially the halo. There's no so-called CTV. So we differentiate between the tumor, which is the gross tumor volume, the GTV, and the clinical target volume, which is everything with the microscopic infiltration zone around the tumor, normally outside of the brain or with primary brain tumors, we use a microscopic infiltration zone, but not for brain metastasis. So the GTV will equal to the CTV. And then normally we use a planning target volume, a PTV margin, which can range from zero to three millimeters normally with a radio surgery. So for example, in the gamma knife world, normally no separate PTV margin is used. But if, we, if you switch to a linear accelerator based treatment, at least one millimeter is used, but there's no firm consensus. So it's a T1 plus gadolinium based delineation, no strong PTV consensus. And I will quickly discuss this as well. Now, <clears throat> here are two prospective randomized studies compare, comparing different margins of, for radiosurgical treatments. So the first study used one millimeter versus three millimeter. The second study used zero millimeter versus two millimeters. And what you can see, of course, between the two studies, uh, the local control was different. And we need to be careful to compare that because they also use slightly different uh, radio surgical doses. But the most important fact is that the local control was not significantly different. But what you can immediately see that the toxicity with the smaller margins was much more favorable compared to the larger margins. So that currently the recommendation is to use margins less than two millimeters. There's no consensus whether or not to use no margin like zero or one millimeter, but this is at least something we should keep in mind. My recommendation is if you're on a linear accelerator, I would use a one millimeter margin to really catch the end-to-end -end accuracy, which is around a millimeter. Now, we should also take the time interval between imaging and treatment into consideration. And this is also an example from the colleagues from Erlangen, where you can see here the image on the left and the right have an interval of 14 days. And not only the edema is growing, but also the lesion. This is certainly an extreme example, but it gives you an indication that um, tumor grows um, might play a role. The edema might shift the lesion and might change the appearance. So you have a geometric um, inaccuracy. And also you need to take the, the glucocorticoid use into consideration. That's a very important point. If you do your radiosurgical treatment, afterwards you should not commence steroids unless you redo your imaging. So this is very important. There is a risk for significant geometric changes within days. And if you look now on the interval, here are several different studies, <clears throat> and it's difficult to say whether everything is always growing. Sometimes it's always also getting um, smaller. It depends on the use of steroids. It depends on the use of systemic treatment. So the important point is that <clears throat> these are highly variable dynamics, even irrespective of time. So there's no optimal interval to say, oh, you should wait, you can wait two days or you can wait seven days. 
what we can read out from this data is it should not be long, longer than seven day, but you should implement your imaging and your treatment as fast as possible within days. And we try to limit it to five to seven days to really account for these highly variable dynamics. Um, there's also something else, uh, not only the, um, the, the changes from imaging to start of treatment, but there's also the possibility if you, for example, do fractionated treatment. So for radiosurgical treatment in one session, this does not pose a problem. But if you go for a fractionated treatment beyond three or five fractions, you need to be aware that over time, either due to tumor growth, because radiation has not yet kicked in with its effect, or due to radiation-induced changes, your volumes can change significantly. So they can enlarge, or they can even shrink if radiation has an effect and kicks in. And there has been also a study that if you use more than 10 fractions and the overall treatment time is more than 14 days, you can have significant changes either to the better or the worse in around 30% of the patient. So there's no impact on outcome observed, but especially with shrinkage, I would be very careful because there's a risk of toxicity. So, there might still be reasons to do fractionated treatment, but if the treatment is exceeds seven or one week, uh, it might be reasonable to have a mid-treatment replanning or at least a mid-treatment recheck. Now, if we look at the dose prescription, we have the RTOG-based prescription depending on size. So, um, and I apologize, this is exactly mixed up, so I'm more than happy to provide the correct, corrected slice. Um, I deeply apologize for that. The numbers should be flipped around. So if it's less than two centimeters, we can give 24 gray. If it's between two and three centimeters, we can give 18 gray. And everything beyond three gray and four, uh, four centimeters should receive 50 gray. So this is a risk adapted dose depending on the size. Of course, we here have the problem, the larger a lesion gets, the more tumor cells you have and normally, the, no, the larger the tumor cell size and the, the cell density, we need more dose. So with this approach, we have the risk that as the lesion increases, we reduce the dose. So the lesion would need more dose, but with a single fraction, we need to decrease this just out of safety aspects. And that's why, um, oh, I'm sorry, there's another possibility. And this is a dose response-based um, prescription that we look at a reasonable biologically effective dose compared to a single fraction that confers a similar local control at 12 months. And this would then correspond, for example, to one times 18, three times nine gray or five times six gray. And the fractionation might be especially reasonable if you have larger lesions than two centimeters. So as soon as you need to adjust your single fraction dose to less than 18 gray, it makes sense to readjust and go for a fractionated treatment. It might be reasonable concurrent um, to uh, immunotherapy, and it might also be reasonable by, for multiple brain metastases, even though they're only in the range of one or two centimeters, but there we do not have enough data for single fraction treatment and a more careful approach might be reasonable. So if, a V12, and we will see that in the next slide, ex is exceeded for radio, radio surgery in a single fraction, it seems reasonable to switch to a fractionated um, approach in multiple brain metastases and use one of the schedules that you see on the right-hand side. Now, another very important aspect is the dose prescription and the inhomogeneity uh, we normally exploit. So normally, if we try to treat a tumor um, with conventional fractionation, the dose within the tumor is always the same uh, as in the border, as in the center of the, the tumor itself. For radiosurgery, we try to have an inhomogeneous dose distribution, and this is depicted here. 
if this is a cross section around the tumor the, across the tumor the yellow bar represents the cross section up, uh, along the diameter of the lesion and the border is depicted by the arrows and then we have our ptv margin which is depicted by the red arrow um, and normally we prescribe our dose to the border of the PTV. This is the 100% dose. And in regular conventional fractionation, the dose stays the same across the lesion here by, uh, with 100%. With radiosurgery, it's different. We try to have a certain prescription dose, but increase the dose as we move inside the, tumor, the target and across the target. This, this means that as soon as we reach the tumor here, the tumor border, the dose has already built up to around 110 to 125 gray and the maximum, and it depends on the prescription and on the technology you use, you can have 125 to 150% of the initially prescribed dose. So if we try, if we try to translate this, so if we give 20 gray here at the border, and this is 25%, <clears throat> Um, higher, and then we are already at 25 gray um, of the initial prescribed dose, or this can easily um, be increased to 30 gray in a single fraction. So the dose in the tumor is significantly higher than what is prescribed. So what you read in the medical record is uh, very often it's, for example, 20 gray prescribed to the 80% isodose, which means if it's 100% and here 125%, which means that the maximum in the metastasis is 25 gray. So the biological dose, it's much higher in the target itself. And this is also depicted here from the planning system. And this is the distance across the lesion. You can see you have a dose buildup here uh, um, around this blue line. The GTV, the tumor itself starts, and we have a very high dose of 25 gray within the lesion. And then in the, uh, in the PTV margin, uh, the dose drops again to around 20, 20 gray, but we have a very high homogeneous dose, although it's inhomogeneously prescribed. And there's also one report from Lucha et al. from 2018 that this higher dose indict the target also confers better local control. Now, I already mentioned the V12 early on. This is very old data that had been introduced into Quantec, uh, looking at the volume of normal brain exposed in a single fraction. And you can see that around uh, uh, the parameter of V12, sometimes V20, if you cross 10 cubic centimeters, the radiation necrosis rate, at least what we see in the images, and partly also symptomatic, steeply rises. So one parameter to take into account if you judge your plan with a single fraction is the V12 grade should optimally be below 10 cc doesn't mean that you cannot do the radio surgery, but you need to be aware that your expected radiation necrosis rate might uh, significantly increase. And it might be more reasonable to go to a three or five fraction schedule. Um, what's also important for multiple brain metastases. So all these parameters have been evaluated on a single brain metastasis level. So if you treat multiple brain metastases and multiple, we haven't defined yet, multiple could be two to four, which is on an evidence-based level, level one, or it could be five to 10 or more than 10. And optimally, you should look uh, on a global GTV level, but you should also look uh, at an individual lesion level, what your V12 level, for example, for signal fraction, or here the other volume-based parameters for three or five fractions are, and then visually check and quantitatively check whether your plan is safe. So the V12 for single fraction is quite established for uh, radio surgery. It's not yet clear why it's that low parameter. We would rather expect a higher dose be more relevant in the brain, but at least as a guidance, it works quite nicely. And also the other two parameters 
for the fractionated treatment are somewhat more weak. This is the best we have as evidence and it's a good guidance. Now, if we look at multiple brain metastasis and for me, multiple brain metastasis is from a planning and from a evidence base is really five and more. We have very good evidence for one to four brain metastasis with regards to efficacy and safety, but everything that's beyond it gets blurry. We have a very nice registry from uh, Japan, which I will show later. But if we have 10 or 15 brain metastases, we need also to look at the planning aspects and delivery aspects. And I think the PTV coverage is not that much difference if you look in the literature or if you do the planning yourself. The conformity is especially if you look at a single isocenter technique or a multiple isocenter technique. Single isocenter means you just can irradiate all 10, 15, 20 um, metastasis with a single plan which has one single center where it's focused. A multiple isocenter means either you cluster your metastasis that are nearby or each metastasis gets its own isocenter. So for PTV coverage, the difference might not be that important. The conformity is certainly better with, this, um, with the multiple isocenter technique, but the brain dose is certainly also much more favorable um, because you, you can steer um, your and conform much better with your collimator and with your, uh, with your uh, single leaves. And the, 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 the major difference being really the delivery time. So with the single, um, with the single isocenter technique, you really have a fast delivery and with the multiple isocenter time, uh, it's really much, uh, much, much smaller, uh, much, much longer. And that's why here and here you see an example of a single isocenter technique where you can target multiple uh, brain metastases. And here you have uh, a plan where you just use one isocenter. And with regards to outcome, we've investigated this in more than 300 patients with more than 1,000 brain metastases. There's no difference in local control. So for us, a single ISO technique is feasible and is best for patient convenience. And that's why we completely switched um, to a single ISO center technique. Now, if we look at the follow-up, we know that after radiosurgery only, we have a higher distant failure rate because we can omit whole brain radiotherapy without detriment in, in outcome. Uh, those recurrence are possibly amenable to repeat radiosurgery. And that's why we recommend uh, a, a follow-up every two to three months. In our department, it's three months. And it's also mandatory if you omit whole brain radiotherapy. And local control in the first six months is very good and local recurrence is improbable and pseudo progression um, needs to be excluded. And this is shown here in the analysis we did our own. Um, this is the local control for metastasis ranked based on the median of the volume. So the larger the metastasis, the higher the, um, the local recurrence rate. But if you look at one year, it's around 85 and 95%. And at six year, it's more than 95%. So local control within the first six months is really improbable. So still with the omission of whole brain radiotherapy, close MRI follow-up is standard of care. Now, <clears throat> we need to evaluate in the follow-up and here a clear recommendation is available with the uh, response assessment in neuro-oncology system. And this is also very specific um, to and dedicated to brain metastasis. And for the other criteria, a specific mentioning of brain metastasis is not available. That's why we use and recommend the application of the RANO and also the IRANO for response assessment of brain metastasis and with the clear parameters. And as well, um, we can then use uh, the classification of complete response, partial response, stable disease, and progressive disease as well, with the parameters depicted here. 
and also use it to just classify the CNS, so the cranial situation, the extracranial situation separately, but then also for the progression-free survival, we can combine the information of both. So the beauty is that we can separately assess it and we can do a combined assessment for cranial and extracranial disease. Um, it's also very important to look at how do radiosurgery compare to whole brain radiotherapy. And what we see here on the left-hand side is a comparison, a comparison of a radiosurgical cohort to a whole brain radiotherapy cohort. The comparison is not quite fair because the whole brain radiotherapy group certainly is unselected, uh, although it was prospective, but may really represent a selection bias and, and a worse uh, collective. But the important message is here, the omission of whole brain therapy certainly does not negatively impact um, overall survival. And here, this has been also shown in the uh, EGFR driver mutated uh, collected uh, non-small cell lung cancer. So I think it's a safe approach. Maybe we could also advocate a slight benefit because of the higher biological efficacy uh, of the doses we are giving in radiosurgery. So if technically feasible, radiosurgery should be the preferred option over whole brain radiotherapy, at least um, for one to four brain metastases, but we will also see that we push the limit to more brain metastases as well. And here just recently um, published, uh, this is a comparison of whole brain ra radiotherapy to radiosurgery for multiple brain metastases. And here really the focus was on multiple brain metastases. The colleagues did a non-randomized comparison, used the prospective um, cohort of radiosurgery patients and compared it to historical controls of whole brain radiotherapy. And here, of course, we need to be careful again that he is a, certainly an inherent selection bias that if you have a historical control of whole brain radiotherapy patients, they stem from a different era as with respect to um, systemic therapy. But again, the signal is no detriment by radiosurgery only. So we certainly can do this safely. What we see that there's a difference in the development of new brain metastasis if we use whole brain radiotherapy compared to radiosurgery. So still the effect of uh, inter distant intracranial progression is there, but we can, but it does not have an impact on overall survival. And maybe we can salvage those uh, with repeat radiosurgery without switching the, um, the systemic treatment. So we have a distant, higher distant failure, but it does not translate in lower overall survival. This was the overview of the, what I wanted to say about radio surgical management of brain metastasis and really focusing on the technology aspect and on the planning aspect. Now I would like to switch on giving an overview how we could manage brain metastasis in general, rather taking a high sky um, and not a zoomed in look at it. So, First of all, I think it's um, quite important that we look at the prognostic scores that are available. And here it's very specific. What I show is the prognostic score for non-small cell lung cancer, but there are also the respective GPA scores available for breast cancer, for uh, colorectal cancer, for renal cell cancer, and at very generic for the remainder of the tumors. But I think the important message is that we should use um, these scores and they have been refined over time and recently published again. So that we should use the refined scores to make an educated guess on the projected over survival. And it makes also sense to adjust and validate uh, these scores on uh, your own cohort and see how you compare to what has been published because sometimes there are significant differences 
And it's always best to inform the patients with the data you have at hand from your own cohort. Now, if we quickly look at the different possibilities we have available. So we have surgery, and here these are very general assumptions. And also here, certainly we are pushing the limits with um, newer technology, safer resection, maybe a uh, small whole uh, bi biopsy based um, interventions. But this is a general overview, mostly solitary lesions, um, whether the extracranial disease is controlled or not. Of course, in symptomatic patients where we need a quick relief of symptoms, if we need histology, if it's easily accessible, and if the performance status and the prognosis is good. Now, radiosurgery, recommended for one to four brain metastasis in oligo or asymptomatic patients, a less than three centimeter size. You saw one slice that you can also treat three to four centimeter uh, lesions. But here we have to balance local control and um, surgery and post-op radius therapy might be more appropriate. appropriate. It's very well suited for deep lesions. And here I wrote, consider a five to 10 brain metastasis and we are even pushing the limits and trying to go for more brain metastasis than the 10 mentioned here. And the use of whole brain radiotherapy is really diminishing. If you have multiple brain metastasis, you cannot deliver safe radiosurgery. You have lipidomeningeal spread. They are symptomatic. And as I said, not amenable to radiosurgery itself. Now, um, this is an algorithm I took for the management of non small it's a lung cancer, but I realized it's a very um, generic. Oh, it's a very generic um, um, algorithm, and I would like to walk you through this algorithm. And there should be a red cross, and really mention solid cancer. So the first question is: Is it a solitary brain metastasis, or has it a mass effect? And if yes, of course, not only consider, but optimally go for a resection. And if you look at the data that's backing up surgery for brain metastasis, it's the quite old patch uh, trial comparing 25 patients that have received um, whole brain radiotherapy with two 12 times three gray with or without surgery. And the upper curve is the patients that received um, uh, surgery and whole brain radiotherapy, which was improved with the combined modality approach, and the overall survival was also improved with the combined modality approach. But still, we need to take into account that this was really at a time where the overall survival of those patients was overall poor. And it's a poor overall survival at that time, so that has certainly switched. And formally, we need to say that this evidence for resection is really for N equals one brain metastasis. And we certainly need new evidence that it's also reasonable to do so if we have multiple brain metastases present, but we have one that needs uh, resection because it's symptomatic. <clears throat> now, if we have done uh, a surgical resection, we should consider and discuss postoperative radiosurgery. And this is the Cocker trial, which is also now already quite some years old, which observed uh, in the group where they tried to omit whole brain radiotherapy. So they either gave radiosurgery or um, uh, they operated on those patients and then randomized to whole brain radiotherapy uh, and observation. And the recurrence rate in the surgery only arm was quite high although the overall survival in the group was <clears throat> identical, but still that led to the recommendation that um, you can do a radiosurgery without whole brain radiotherapy, but it could not be recommended that you do a surgery without radiotherapy and still in the post-op setting, whole brain therapy was still implemented at that time. <clears throat> now, the question is, can we also use stereotactic radiotherapy? And fortunately, there have been these two trials and they have been really important because currently uh, <clears throat> there was the possibility that patients with limited brain metastasis could have received different treatment. If they received radiosurgery, <clears throat> 
upfront without surgery, they did not receive whole brain radiotherapy. The same patient with one brain metastasis who got operated was then recommended whole brain radiotherapy, although the community felt that we should move away from whole, whole brain radiotherapy, which we already did um, without the proper evidence, and the proper evidence is here. Either you do whole brain or radiotherapy or radiosurgery, there's no difference in overall survival. And there was an, a follow up, a parallel study that looked at radiosurgery versus observation. And it could be reproduced that the local control was significantly improved if you gave radiosurgery in this cohort. So that's why. Uh, in the very good prognosis patients, we really recommend post-operative cavity radiosurgery after resection. But this was a very important message that this could be implemented as well after surgery. <clears throat> now, um, if we have multiple brain metastases, then we need to check whether or not there's a driver mutation available. And still, if we look at the systemic treatment option for brain metastasis. So systemic treatment has quite poor response, uh, response rates. <clears throat> and if we look at the response rates of immunotherapy, it's not as promising as, for example, for targeted treatment itself. So um, with multiple brain metastasis, we still cannot fully rely on systemic treatment only, so we need local treatment. There may be response rates, but especially durable control is still an unsolved need here with systemic treatment. And this is also shown here if we give IO only for brain metastasis. So the rest, it's first of all, it's only phase two. It's not a lot of patients and the response rates are not that convincing uh, and compared to a local treatment approach like radiosurgery or surgery itself. Now, if those patients are eligible for stereotactic radiosurgery, and mostly this would be for me patients with one to four brain metastases, because there we have the level one evidence, but also with multiple brain metastases, where we can safely, based on the criteria I showed you, can deliver this, there we should go for an upfront um, radiosurgery approach. And <clears throat> Here we have the level, level one evidence for CNS oligometastasis. All the studies that finally showed that with one to four brain metastasis, you can safely omit whole brain radiotherapy, even, either in the situation where you have intact brain metastasis or in the post operative setting. So we can give radiosurgery, and this is the case in oligometastasis, CNS oligometastasis, but and it's very important to look here also to the fact that this has a tremendous effect on the neurocognitive side as well. So it's not only about the outcome with regards to overall survival, but still the cognitive progression rate at three months is significantly uh, um, uh, lower compared to the whole brain radiotherapy group. But um, we also try to replace whole brain radiotherapy in patients with multiple brain metastases. And here we have the very uh, famous registry published by Yamamoto comparing one, two to four and four to 10 brain metastases. And here a very recent group, four to 10 and more, to, more than 10 uh, brain metastases uh, during patients in ALK and GVR driver mutated non-small cell lung cancer. And the important message, it seems that as soon as you have two or more brain metastases, the overall survival is equal, whether or not you give whole brain radiotherapy or radiosurgery. And I think uh, this is very important and we could implement and switch to uh, radiosurgery at all. The question is whether or not we really need full prospective randomized evidence in this setting and whether or not this is really feasible to do. But it's very important, no survival difference. Nevertheless, if we cannot do proper radiosurgery, there's still whole brain radiotherapy as a valid tool. And we can think of a hippocampal sparing approach together with memantine 
And this is the uh, phase three uh, trial conducted in the United States where patients were assigned to the use of whole brain radiotherapy plus minus hippocampal avoidance and memantine with the respective follow-up. There was no difference in over survival PFS or toxicity, but there was a significant difference uh, in learning and memory at six months and with the use of um, uh, um, memantine and hippocampal avoidance, the, 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 the loss could be reduced uh, to about a half. This is not standard of care in Europe. It's implemented as a recommendation and it needs to be seen whether this is really a long-term strategy, long-term data has been published. But if you look at the number that entered the trial and the patient number that really reached the six months time points, we have to carefully weight this also to the use of memantine and hippocampal avoidance. Now, this is the only study and it's the study in non-small cell lung cancer and only applicable to this, but still there's a place in a situation where we need to question do we need a tumor specific treatment at all? And in those patients that obviously were a very poorly selected cohort with not a lot of systemic therapeutic options, we also need to critically discuss whether or not to implement any form of local treatment or especially whole brain radiotherapy in this situation. So here, Consider this option of best supportive care if no effective systemic option exists, if radiosurgery is not feasible, if the patient has a poor prognostic uh, or KPS, and the GPA and the prognosis is very poor as well. We need to be aware that both groups were very, a very poor uh, group with regards to overall survival. Now, if there's a driver mutation, um, then it really gets interesting because one could uh, say in multiple brain metastases, especially, uh, we could implement a, a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor strategy alone and go for surveillance with MRI um, only. And if we look here with targeted treatment, the response rates are much more favorable and sometimes reach 80 to 90%. And also here we have high objective response rates, but the durable control is certainly much better than with systemic treatment and also with IO. But normally between six to 12 months, those patients develop resistance um, as well. And there we need to have a strategy as well. So we can go for um, TKOI only approach, but I will elude on that later on as well. And the other question is, should we combine it with stereotactic radiosurgery? And there we do not have firm data. With one to four brain metastases, we still need to rely on the level one evidence we have from the previously conducted randomized trials in general. With multiple brain metastases, it's still an individual decision making, but it might make sense that we have a smaller volume radiotherapy with early radiosurgery and targeted treatment. So <clears throat> early radiosurgery means we give um, um, targeted treatment and then implement an early integration of radiosurgery. We have a smaller size. Um, it might be more effective. It has less toxicity. And we avoid the progression which occurs in up to 40% here in those patients. Uh, we have data for EGFR mutated non-small cell lung cancer that early integration, the upfront integration might even confer an overall survival benefit. This data is really difficult to interpret because the patient that did not receive upfront radiosurgery were mostly asymptomatic and receiving uh, targeted treatment, while the ones that received radiotherapy uh, were symptomatic, um, although the intracranial progression rate was not that different, but still there's a signal in that data. From a systematic review, um, uh, here only in EGFR mutated tumors for lung cancer, there might also be uh, a benefit with regards to overall survival. And here 
um, colleagues recently published uh, over survival in patients with four to 10 and more than 10 brain metastases. They treated with upfront radiosurgery and the respective targeted treatment. And of course, uh, if you had the active systemic treatment available, patient had a much favorable over survival. But the nice thing about this was the patient stayed almost 100% free of whole brain radiotherapy during this uh, time. So I think this is a very important aspect to consider as well, to defer radio, whole brain radiotherapy with a radiosurgery approach to multiple targets. Now I've given you an overview on the management of brain metastasis in the different primary and post-operative settings. Now I will quickly touch on special considerations. And first I would like to talk about early versus delayed radiosurgery. And the question is really, why would we need upfront or early radiotherapy? And some hints I've already given you in the previous slides, but I would go into much, a little bit more detail. So what does it mean? Upfront really means you have the diagnosis of brain metastasis, you give your radiosurgery and you start your systemic treatment immediately. The early means you start your systemic treatment and you do a two, four, six weeks later um, cranial restaging and on persistence of the lesions you treat, so on demand. And the third approach is the delayed treatment. So you give your systemic treatment and you send the patient in a uh, watchful waiting and surveillance strategy. And as soon as you see a progression on the CMRI, you go for on-demand radiotherapy, especially if you do not want to switch your systemic treatment. <clears throat> and again, showing here um, the response rates for uh, systemic treatment and targeted treatment as well. And my discussion previously, we have a response rate. It's high for targeted treatment, lower for the other systemic treatments. The duration is not long enough. So we really need to consider that we have um, a durable control. Now, um, there might be earlier symptom response with upfront radiosurgery if you combine it with uh, immunotherapy. So here, a group compared non-concurrent treatment, the time uh, to progression and to, to, to partial remission was longer than in the concurrent. The dose needed was smaller and the steroid use was similar in both groups. And here it was a comparison between chemo and IO. So for chemotherapy, it did not play that much of a difference maybe because chemo kicked in earlier, but for immunotherapy, which needs some time to kick in, it was much shorter um, if you gave it upfront and the response rate, even for the larger metastasis was improved. So you might have an earlier symptom um, response. And this, I, will, I also showed you have a smaller volume radiotherapy with upfront radiosurgery in IO. So, it's very important that you have the, partly some may experience an increased volume if you wait and uh, upfront might, def, uh, might, uh, might restrict this risk. So it's reasonable not to wait and check whether IO kicks in, but to treat upfront, not to have patients progressing and then treating um, larger volumes. So it might provide a safety benefit. Here, this I already showed, you have a smaller volume radiotherapy with early radiosurgery and targeted treatment. So that's different to IO. So you give your targeted treatment and then you check within four to six weeks and maybe on persistence, you then have a smaller volume and also give a consolidation. And this might also be a safety aspect as well. Potentially, it can improve over survival if you give it concurrently. This is a systematic review. That's the only data we have currently available. We need to uh, review this with a, a word of caution, but nevertheless, it's not detrimental. And I've shown you um, the benefits um, of treating earlier 
and upfront, just the slide in the previous slides. And the same situation we have with upfront radiosurgery and targeted treatment. I've also shown you that, that with, in a systematic review, there might be an overall survival benefit uh, if you give upfront radiosurgery with the uh, respective targeted treatment. Now, then the important question is when can we opt for delaying radiotherapy for brain metastasis? And there you see that uh, I have a very clear opinion uh, as well. I've already shown you this uh, local control curve. So we have, with radiosurgery, we have excellent local control within the first year. But a patient to benefit from this excellent local control needs to survive longer than one year. So a patient that does not have the respective prognosis to reach one year does not need a local control of 90%. So we need, again, prognostic scores. I sh I've shown you the GPA. If this is too tedious to use, and I'm very honest, we are not very stringent as well in Zurich to use those scores. We try to implement the distant metastasis or brain metastasis velocity, but a very simple score is the performance status. So in a patient with a poor performance status, local control of 90% at one year is not the question. But if a patient has a long-term chance of survival, then he needs local control, then radiotherapy, in my opinion, should not be deferred. With the other patients, I think, radiotherapy should be omitted and can safely be omitted. Uh, we have the question about multiple disseminated brain metastases where we fail to deliver safe radiosurgery and where we know that systemic treatment has a good effect for the next nine to 12 months and we rather implement a salvage strategy uh, in a delayed um, um, in a delayed approach where only those patients who truly progress and maybe have an oligo progress uh, are the ones that benefit from an integration of radiotherapy. And this is also shown here that we have a very, very favorable outcome, for example, within non-small cell lung cancer and eye translocated tumors where we safely can integrate such a strategy. But um, there's another in interesting aspect, and I already pointed already quite a few times on it here again in lung cancer uh, with mutations where you have vast brain metastasis. You induce those patients with your targeted treatment, and then you do your restaging and you do your salvage radiotherapy, and you try to avoid whole brain radiotherapy. So here, the first data is coming in that this might be a reasonable approach, especially if you don't want to switch your otherwise effective systemic treatment. So start with it, look how the patient responds. And there are certainly patients who have a limited progression and where it might make sense to salvage the brain and then do not, um, uh, and they do not need whole brain radiotherapy. And this brings me also to the next point. So we are always discussing about first diagnosis of brain metastasis and treatment. But we have patients that present with repetitive occurrence of brain metastasis. And not only because of the increased use of radiosurgery, this also has been the case after whole brain radiotherapy, but especially because a lot of those patients live longer than we have seen 10 years ago. And this is depicted by this life cycle, this oligometastatic and oligoprogression life cycle, that we have patients that can stay very long time on the same drug, but present with limited progression. And here, a local salvage, and of course, here it's radius surgery, but you can also discuss this extracranially. You do not always discuss it with radius surgery. Let's call it local ablative approach. So surgery in this context certainly plays a role as well. But we have these repetitively treated patients or these patients presenting with repetitive occurrence of brain metastasis. 
And here we need to think of solutions and not only go for the approach, the patient has failed once, now he needs whole brain radiotherapy. And I think here are already some data and one study is uh, from our center at all, um, as well. But this is the data and again with the largest study coming from Japan, where it seems that it's pretty safe to do repeat radiosurgery to avoid um, whole brain radiotherapy in almost 80% of those cases, and also look at the overall survivor from the second radiosurgery, certainly not inferior what we see in the primary setting and what we see with whole brain radiotherapy. Of course, these patients are very selected, but we can spare them the neurocognitive detriment of whole brain radiotherapy. And that's why I think we can safely implement it. For this repeat treatment, a very nice um, parameter is the brain metastasis velocity, uh, first also coined by Sperduto, and we have validated this in our own brain metastasis cohort, and it's very nice. From the occurrence of new metastasis, so the number of new metastasis divided by the time and month, gives you a very nice score and you can separate this in three curves and you can adjust and then you can judge how the patient will fare and decide whether or not it's reasonable to go for repeat radiosurgery and again use the same approach. Does this patient benefit from a long-term local control beyond 12 months? And I would say yes, the blue curve patients would and I certainly would implement then a repeat radiosurgery approach. And this also uh, could be nicely translated into the extracranial space. So I think for the repeat approach, we now have nice tools with these metastasis velocity scores to really select patients for the treatment. And it's a very simple approximation for the dynamics of the tumor, but it still needs prospective validation. And with this, I would like to conclude. I, I think that even in the era of effective systemic treatment, we need effective local control uh, by radiosurgery and surgery, especially in the context of CNS oligometastasis. We definitely see a shift of paradigm. If we have actual mutations, we see patients surviving longer with effective immunotherapies. And we have the new tool of repeat treatment for multiple brain metastases, but here we really need prospective evidence and that's currently lacking. And the optimal management, you know that I'm fond of uh, scores, should consider really the individual patient disease status and the prognosis. And here we need to use prognostic scores. They are available. They are also quite, uh, especially the, the, the GPA heavily validated. So please implement it, use it and then we can see how to integrate best into decision making. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, many thanks for the wonderful lecture and for those detailed information. That was really interesting. Uh, I wanted to ask a few questions. Uh, first of all, so uh, you mentioned that uh, um, for in case of a solitary lesion or in case of mass effect, uh, the primary treatment is uh, surgical, I mean, uh, surgical removal. But I was wondering uh, where do you see the role of stereotactic uh, neurosurgery, not the radiation, but stereotactic removal of, um, I mean, of the metastasis? And it can, it can possibly be combined with stereotactic radiosurgery. Um, I'm not sure whether I do the uh, get understand the question correctly. So you mean the symptomatic metastasis and the solitary, and you um, and I favored in these cases the neurosurgical approach, and also a very focused um, resection, but would then recommend depending on the patient's prognosis and performance status, postoperative radio radio surgery. Um, you st it's still possible in symptomatic patients uh, to go for radiosurgical approach. So if the patient responds to, uh, to, to the application of steroids and is, well, not oligosymptomatic, he can still have some con symptoms. But for example, um, there's a decision regarding the disease status uh, or the, 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 the difficulty to operate safely then a fractionated 
stereotactic radiotherapy approach can be feasible as well. Um, and you saw the image I showed you from fractionated radiotherapy. So there's a good possibility that over a week's time, such a lesion can shrink and also the edema can reduce. So there's a possibility there. And with the three columns, it was not meant to be mutually exclusive, but these were the major drivers uh, for the single um, modalities to go for. Man, thanks. Just to further clarify, I, I was uh, asking not the open surgery, but stereotactic minimally invasive uh, sur surgical removal. I'm not sure if it is um, widely used. We don't use it at least here. Yeah, and I wanted to know if stereotactic uh, surgical removal, stereotactic metastasectomy can be combined with uh, radiation. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, yes, yes, of course. Um, so the question is rather, um, then I would combine it uh, in, in any case, because you always need to check um, the post-operative uh, resections, or at least in MRI, uh, whether or not all the contrast enhancing aspects of the lesion have been removed. And I think it can be combined, but not in the sense that you combine it in the same session. Because yeah. it's so it's it's so different. The approach is um, so different, and you need a different workflow. Um, so it, I would do it. Uh, you need to do it sequentially. Okay, thank you. Uh, I was also wondering if uh, this ready surgery could be combined with immunotherapy or targeted therapy. Uh, I mean, you mentioned that in case of multiple uh, metastases, you cannot rely on the systemic treatment. But uh, have you ever tried to combine them, or if? if has any um, advantages of combining them, yeah. Yeah, um, yes, and from the last slide about early or upfront radiosurgery and delayed, that's what I meant with, yes, you can combine them and you should combine them. So the question, so the point is you do radiosurgery and plus minus you give your targeted treatment or immunotherapy. The major question is, do you give it concurrently, meaning at the time you do your radiotherapy, is it allowed for the drug to be present or uh, would we recommend a drug holiday? And this has, it is an ongoing discussion and where recently there has been a very nice consensus being published. But basically with most targeted treatments and most immunotherapies, there's no definite need for drug quality. There are very few exceptions, for example, uh, VEGF targeting drugs, where we need to be very careful. But on the other hand, for example, in our department in, or in, in Zurich, we do not stop the drugs, but we explicitly try to combine them, except uh, for some VEGF drugs and uh, a, a, a single uh, BRAF targeted drug. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, also, you mentioned uh, the memory problems and possible use of memantine for uh, radiotherapy, but that was, I guess, for whole brain therapy. And in January, we hosted a lecture by Professor Patrick Yang, uh, he's uh, head of uh, neuro-oncology at Harvard University Hospitals. And he also discussed this uh, using uh, memantine, and he was favoring that. And I was wondering, uh, uh, what is, I mean, if uh, stereotactic radiosurgery has the benefit in terms of those side effects compared to whole brain therapy in terms of memory or general, how do you assess and manage potential side effects? <clears throat> hmm. So first, first of all, um, from the lecture I gave, although we are really lacking very hard level one evidence for multi radio surgery for multiple brain metastasis, I think it's possible to make some, to deduce some, some, um, some analogies from data we have in comparing radiosurgery to whole brain radiotherapy. Personally, I do not think that there's a difference in overall survival between whole brain radiotherapy and radiosurgery, just because 
uh, radio surgery induces more uh, distant brain failure. Um, doesn't so we do not have an indication that this really translates into a um, inferior over survival. So my personal take, if I would think of managing side effects from the treatments, I would try to go for a radiosurgical approach whenever possible, because this gives the least risk of neurocognitive um, decline in those patients and you have a higher biological effectiveness. Um, with the whole brain hippocampal avoidance in memantine, it needs to be seen whether this will be really a strategy that will be implemented worldwide. Uh, currently, um, it's not, not used in Europe and you may be aware of the conflicting data of hippocampal avoidance in um, neurocognitive preservation. So there are some there's some reluctance in Europe to implement this on a one-on-one -on -one level. Uh, unfortunately, as soon as you have those neurocognitive side effects from treatment, it's very different, difficult to interfere. So the best thing is to make the upfront decision how to use and how to, and what type of radiotherapy and technique to use um, to have the least effect on on, on neurocognition. And if I got it right, uh, the uh, stereotactic radiosurgery has also high chance of, uh, in, in case of, for example, temporal low, it, it also has a high ch chance of uh, developing the memory problems, just like the whole brain therapy. Yes. Um, no, um, it, it depends on, well, you need to be aware of where the metastasis is located and how the dose distribution looks like. So um, normally, if we talk about one to four brain metastases and with our vigorous um, MRI screening, most brain metastases are really depicted when they are one to two centimeters large in size. So there you can be very focused and the risk, um, except it's really sitting um, in the hippocampal or parahippocampal um, area, um, then you might, get at risk of neurocognitive problems, but not in the same magnitude compared to whole brain radiotherapy. And this has been nicely shown by the study uh, by Brown quite some years ago. Um, still, you have uh, some neurocognitive decline or progression in those patients with, brain uh, with radiosurgery as well. <clears throat> but for me, most of it is already the baseline risk of the brain metastasis interfering with neurocognitive function by itself and also by the poop prognosis and the patients progressing very rapidly. So the ones you saw in the publication on repeat radiosurgery are really the positively selected that had a limited progression inside the brain and outside the brain and could be safely salvaged with local treatment and then had a better over survival. But that we inf induce uh, like a really neurocognitive deterrent with radiosurgery, that's really the exception. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, uh, uh, Professor Nicholas, if you uh, stop your screen sharing, we can see each other bigger. Thank you. Okay. Um, I was also wondering if the introduction of advanced radiation therapies like uh, volumetric modulated arc therapy, VMAT, and uh, intensity modulated radiation therapy, if they have improved these treatment outcomes and reduced toxicity for the patients with multiple brain metastases. Um, that's really, that's a difficult to answer question because um, I'm not aware of a study because these treatment planning and delivery technologies were introduced in a time where we already had shifted or had the possibility for, um, for radiosurgical treatment. So, um, and they, so first of all, for single brain metastasis or for a single, for a multiple isocenter approach. So every brain metastasis gets its own isocenter. They certainly have not, improved the outcomes. And with outcomes, 
I mean, local control or toxicity. But what those t techniques have improved is uh, they have opened the door to do so. So if you imagine uh, with a gamma knife to treat 20 lesions, um, this takes very long time. So you have to separate it on separate days. Even if you do this on a cyber knife, this takes quite long. So with the, uh, uh, with the IMRT and, and, and WIMAT techniques, one thing that was very nice is, first of all, you could collimate very, very nicely and shape to the metastasis. And it certainly has improved uh, the treatment of postoperative cavities because they are much more irregular compared to the old 3D techniques, but it really opened the door for the multiple brain metastasis treatment. So for example, we can easily treat 10 to 20 brain metastases with a single isocenter with a VMAT plan in around 30 minutes. If you compare this to a single isocenter, single lesion approach, and for every 20 metastases, you need your own isocenter, you can multiply the treatment accordingly. So I think those techniques have not improved the outcome um, per se, but they have opened the door to exploit new treatment possibilities we haven't had before. Makes sense. Thank you. And as a last question from my side, I wanted to ask, how do you anticipate the field of stereotactic radiosurgery for multiple brain metastasis to uh, evolve in the upcoming years? And what do you see as the most promising areas of research and uh, innovation in this field? Well, I definitely, I definitely see um, the, the, develop, the development, the fast um, application of high dose treatment to multiple brain metastases. So still right now we can do it because we have streamlined our workflows. But I think what we really need is a, a fast and secure and optimally semi-automated and guided way of treating the patients. So have the targets delineated, have the plan calculated, treat the patient, follow up the patient, then take the new MRIs, incorporate them again, check whether new lesions have developed, how the, the treated lesions are developing, and then do a safe assessment of those new, new lesions and then go for treatment again. And if I look at our patients right now that are coming two, three, four times, and in the end, over time of two to three years, we may have treated 15 to 30 brain metastases longitudinally without the use of whole brain radiotherapy. You can imagine that it's very tedious every three months to take the MRI and then to check which lesion has, has been treated and which lesion is new. And I think there we need methods to do this in an automated and then guided way so that we have a quicker evaluation of those patients. And then we need machines that really can deliver much faster than we do right now. So 30 minutes is nice, but if you look at the whole treatment chain, I think it would be much more interesting to have the treatment faster, even more precise with um, better image guidance, better convenience for the patient. And of course, we need to combine this technology advance also with a better patient selection which patients do really benefit from this high-tech approach. And what we should not do is cosmetics on MRI images. Okay, thank you. We just got a question on the chat section. Um, Mr. Andratzke have uh, stated that uh, surgical intervention is prioritized in uh, easily accessible single metastasis. In such met uh, metastasis, uh, can SRS be performed instead of surgical uh, intervention, which may cause leptomeningeal dissemination? Um, I try to I try to address the question. Um, or hopefully I have understood it correctly. So uh, with, the, with a neurosurgical approach, there is a risk of close bileptomeningeal recurrences. Um, my personal 
take on this is that of course it has been published that it might be a case, especially in non-small cell lung cancer and breast cancer patient. But I personally think that this is over, um, overestimated. Personally, I don't think that it's really clinically uh, a severe problem. There are certain, certain approaches to reduce this. So for example, with neo advent radio surgery and then operation. But clearly, even looking at our own practice, we, we observe this every now and then. But for me, this would not be a point to change the overall management in such a situation directly. I still would recommend surgery if it's clearly indicated. Having said this, of course, easily accessible lesions, um, even with an edema, even with slight symptoms, they are also easily uh, treatable with radiosurgery. So this was not my point before. So you can also operate more deeply located metastasis if necessary. Conversely, you can easily treat superficial brain metastasis with radiosurgery. But I would not um, prefer radiosurgery over neurosurgery just out of fear of lip diminential recurrence. So that I would not do. So if surgery is indicated, I would go for surgery. Okay, thank you. Uh, the same person, he's Dr. Haluk uh, Duskali. Yeah, he's uh, just asking in a private, uh, private chat. So he says that uh, that all surgical intervention may cause left meningeal dissemination. So is not it reasonable to use SRS? He's, uh, this is the same person asking the second yeah, question. Yeah, I think, I, I think I've answered this already. So the, in some series, especially with the two tumor entities I mentioned, um, there is, a risk of leptomeningeal disease of two to 10%. We have not observed this in this high percentage in our, in our series, in our cohort here at the University Hospital of Zurich. Maybe it's reasonable to analyze this on a um, individual center-based manner. Um, of course, I'm more than happy to advocate radio surgery, but not in, in a dogmatic way that we should go, we should not go for surgery because of leptomeningeal risk of leptomeningeal spread. So um, this is pretty clear to me. Okay, uh, thank you. I don't have any, any questions left. Uh, Dr. Suja, is there anything you would like uh, to ask? I want to thank Professor Nicholas for this excellent uh, lecture. And I want the opinion of uh, Professor Bektash Echikos. Thank you, Professor, for your excellent lecture. It's very clear and informative. And uh, I also thank my colleagues doing radio surgery in Turkey. We have close cooperation with them. And uh, I'm, as neurosurgeons, we must be very careful in the post radio surgery uh, period for the uh, occlusion of hemorrhage and malignant edema, I hope. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. I enjoyed giving the lecture. Thank you very much for the questions. And yes, definitely, I think we need to work closely together and, and share as much knowledge as possible uh, to the best outcome of our patients. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Okay, I want to thank everyone who joined us today, this evening. I want to thank Nana and uh, Professor Nicholas, Professor Achikos. And I will uh, close the session. Uh, I hope we can see you in the real life. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so too. Um, I will be traveling this um, October, I will be traveling to Istanbul because from our European society, we will have a palliative radiotherapy course there. Mm -hmm. um, um, otherwise, I do not yet have um, any plans to travel to Turkey, but of course, more than happy to meet in real life. Okay.
Thank you. Oh, just just no. final question. Sorry, I'm just interrupting. I uh, just a final question. You were uh, just mentioning the teamwork. I was wondering, do you manage these patients uh, uh, in person, or do you have an onco board where you discuss yeah. and do you have a multidisciplinary team and onco board? I just forgot yeah. to ask this. Yeah, yeah, we we have a, we not specific for brain metastasis. This we are still missing, but we have a specific with a neuro oncology board. Uh, of, of course, the, the regular entity boards, but we have a specific neuro-oncology board where we do not only present primary brain tumors, but also all brain metastases. And we discuss them there interdisciplinary. And uh, I think that's a very important, that's a very added, a good added value. Okay, that's all. Thank you again. And okay. it was my Thank pleasure you. to be a moderator. Thank you.